Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up with special guest Bob Berg, and he's here today to share with us his book, Adversaries into Allies, Master the Art of Ultimate Influence. I don't know about you, but relationships can be such a difficult thing, and this book is a game changer. Now, for those of you that are new to Bob, he is a highly sought-after speaker at company leadership and sales conferences on topics at the core of the Go-Giver books. A former television personality and top producing salesperson, Bob has shared the platforms with some of today's top business leaders, broadcast professionals, coaches, athletes, and political leaders, including a former U.S. president. So let's welcome to the show, Bob Berg. Well, thank you. It's always such a pleasure to speak with you. Oh, I always love talking with you, especially when we talk about your books. And I can't believe we haven't talked about this one yet. I'm so excited. Oh, Ooh, thank you. Have into allies. Yeah, you know, this is really kind of the culmination of, of everything I've spoken and written about over the past 30 years or so. So it's it's really... This is really the book I kind of felt, uh, I know this sounds trite, but that I was put on earth to write. Well, I found it to be extremely profound. There's so much information in here. And, of course, there's no way we're going to touch on all that today. But I'm so glad we're going to talk about this because this is like where people, this is kind of the make it or break it for people. Mm -hmm. Being able to have these interpersonal relationships that, aren't floundering but flourishing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. It really is, you know, so much about uh, when you think of it, it, you know, it comes down to people skills. That That's really the difference maker between those who are uh, successful, you know, who attain a reasonable level of, of success because even without people skills, you can attain a, a level of success. Uh, you know, you can either be uh, so good at a particular thing, have such an amazing talent in a certain area, um, uh, be really great on what Wallace D. Waddles in his, his great 1910 book, the, Sci- uh, the Science of Getting Rich, called the competitive plane, that you can get to a certain place without having people skills. But as, as Marshall Goldsmith in his masterful book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, talked about uh, – Basically, what got you here won't get you there. <laughs> it's, it's not enough just to have that talent or that one skill set. The people who really attain those immense, those stratospheric levels, if you will, of success tend to be people who really are fantastic in the area of, of people skills. And, and that's really, in a sense, you know, what, what this book is about. Well, when you decided to write this book, was it, I mean, because it's got so much great information in here, and a lot of it is very actionable. People can, you know, take the tools in this book and start making dramatic changes in the way they communicate in their relationships today. When you were writing this book, was it, you know, just this feeling like, gosh, I really have to get this information out there? Was there another reason behind it? Well, you know, I grew up with two wonderful parents. I was very blessed. And my dad, who was, you know, in in the local area where we lived, was, you know, very much um, in the public eye. And I got to see him um, interact with people all the time. And never did I know anyone or have I met anyone since who just had such a, a way with people. So when he met people, they just they just loved them, and and uh, you know when he went back the second time, he you know was already uh, you know known to everyone there, whether it was a restaurant or whether it was a, another business or whether whatever. And and really, what he what he did, which I just always noticed and, and picked up on, was he just always took such a genuine and authentic interest in the other person, and he was able to really make other people feel genuinely good about themselves. And when we can do that, it it really, that, I mean, that's the essence when you think about people skills. Now, in dad's case, it it came very naturally to him. He just had a gift for that. With me, it was not a gift. It was something that I, I fortunately got to observe because it wasn't as natural with me. But what I saw him do 
helped so many people and just, you know, made the world a better place <laughs> wherever he went that um, I just felt like that was my sort of my mission to take that and carry that on. So really, this book to me is a, you know, is really more a, a mission, my life's mission, if you will, to to um, show people that there is a way to do this and it can be learned. It can it can absolutely be learned. And, you know, I like to do things in a way, as you talked about, you know, actionable items. But you shouldn't have to learn, you know, seven this or six things to notice or five. Now, all those, by the way, those kind of teachings and books are all great. They, they, they're they wonderful. But most people won't take the time to actually learn all the things that you have to kind of know in order to be able to, you know, to master that kind of stuff. I wanted to make it so it's very easy for people so that once they read it, once they're exposed to the idea, they can actually just take it and, and run with it and utilize it the very next time that they have a similar situation. Well, and isn't that the truth? I think people just get overwhelmed. If there's like too many steps or too many right. steps that are... Right. It's kind of like, gosh, okay, what am I doing now? Especially because it's kind of uncharted territory. I mean, I'm, I'm like you. I have, I've had to learn interpersonal communications. I think most people have, but to be um, raised by a couple of people who are so, you know, so equipped with, you know, the skill set, you know, it kind of gave you a, a mm-hmm. jump start into what a lot. I think a lot of people are craving to have. Um, yeah, I. I I agree. I was very, very fortunate, and I think it is something that people and, and you know when I get the feedback from people who have either taken some of my trainings or read the book or or what, however they may have heard about it, and they write me back, you know, they email me and talk about how you know they were able to attain satisfaction when dealing with this person or or company that they didn't you know before they didn't think they would have had a chance to do, and that everyone came away you know better off from the transaction. Uh, or they were able to save money on this, or they were able to, you know, uh, it's just, you know, it's such a great feeling. And um, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, you, you know, you teach these kinds of things, and I mean, you're such a, a great teacher and coach, so you know what it's like when you when you receive that kind of feedback. And there's really nothing like it. Yeah, huh, I learned that from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, part well, thank of it. You. That's very I kind. Mean, yeah, I think you were doing this a long time before we ever met. But thank you. That's very kind. Well, it, it is the truth, though, because we are, you know, in, in this kind of area, there's constant room for growth and improvement. Mm-hmm. And I think your book, regardless how good you are in interpersonal communications, adversaries into allies, is hands down, I think, the best book of the year. So I'm just wow! Thank you. <laughs> what amazing compliment. Yeah. Well, and so why don't we start from the basics for our listeners here? You know, because a lot of we hear influence all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, influence this, and you know, you have to be an influencer. <laughs> what does that really mean? Yeah, I agree with you. It's kind of become a word that's that's taken on a lot of different meanings and definitions, and almost sort of lost a little bit of its. Uh, Impact <laughs> almost lost a little bit of it of its influence because of the way it's it's overused and so so yes I think it's always important to begin with a definition just so that we're all on the same track and talking about the same thing uh, I think influence itself can goes a couple levels on a very very basic level we can define influence as simply the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action, usually within the context of a specific goal. By definition, Marianne, that's that's influence. Now, that's its definition, but I would say that that's not its substance or that's not its, its essence, if you will. The essence of influence is pull, pull as opposed to push. Uh, most of us have heard the expression, the question, how far can you push a rope? And we know the answer is not very far, at least not very fast or very effectively, which is why great influencers don't don't push. You, you, know, you never hear someone say, wow, that David or that, uh, that Sonia, she is so influential. She has a lot of push with people, right? She sure is pushy. Wow, what a leader. What an influencer. No, they'd say she's influential. She has a lot of pull with people. That is what influence is. Influence is pull. It's attraction. Great influencers attract people first to themselves and then and only then to their idea. 
And they do this again, not through through pushing their ideas on others, through pushing their will on others, through being push e, but through its very opposite, which is which is pull. Mm-hmm. And being able, well, and, and that makes perfect sense because when you looked at you, know, you look at influence, you look at something that's attracting people. You mm-hmm. know, gosh, I want to be around people who have influence because they have that certain trait that we're looking to develop. Exactly. And then, you know, if we say, so, so, okay, Bob, I, I get it, influence is a pull. So how do you pull, right? How do you pull someone to, to, to you and to your idea? And I think that really, in a sense, goes back to the influencer understanding what I believe, Marianne, was Dale Carnegie's underlying premise in his classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I, I once asked a Dale Carnegie instructor if, if he agreed with me, and he did. Um, and, and to me, I saw that the underlying premise of the entire book in, in one sentence, which did a lot to, to help me. And it was where Dale Carnegie wrote, ultimately, people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. And I think that's so important for us to understand. Uh, you know, I, I often say when I speak it, and I think you and I have talked about this before, when I speak to a sales audience, I'll often say, you know, nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. You know, they're, they're not going to buy from you because you need the money. They're not even going to buy from you because you're a really nice person. <laughs> they're going to buy from you only because they believe they'll be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And so, again, you know, people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. So the great influencer, what we would call the genuine influencer, um, they ask themselves questions to make sure that they're focused in the right direction, which is the other person. So they'll, they'll ask themselves uh, questions such as, is, uh, how does what I'm asking this person to do, how does it align with their goals? How does it align with their wants, their needs, their desires? How does what I want this other person to do, how does it align with their values? What problems am I helping them to solve? What, what, you know, what am I helping them to achieve that they have expressed a, a desire for? And I think when we ask ourselves these questions thoughtfully and intelligently, uh, Genuinely, authentically, not as a way to manipulate another human being into doing our will, but as a way of building everyone in the process. Now we've come a lot closer to earning that person's commitment as opposed to trying to depend on some type of compliance, which is, you know, force or manipulation or intimidation or, or something which, you know, at best is unsustainable. At worst, just is totally ineffective because the person is going to sabotage the process even if they have to do what we want because of some positional type of authority we might have. Yeah. I mean, no, no one likes working with a tyrant, you know, regardless if it's somebody that they're doing business with or, you know, feeling like they're being forced into any kind of position. Even subconsciously, they may try to make the whole thing fall apart. Even Exactly, in- exactly. Yeah. So it's very interesting. You know, in, in, in your book, you talk about ultimate influence mm-hmm. as one of the top traits for overall success, and you explain about that in your book. Yeah, well, I'll, you know, so we talked uh, the, the definition of influence, which was very basic, and then if we say, okay, so what is ultimate influence or genuine influence? Well, I would define that as simply the ability to get the results you want when dealing with others while making them feel genuinely good about themselves, about you, and about the situation. So when you can do that, that's ultimate influence. The thing is, is you talk about perception and how important all that is throughout this entire process. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I think a lot of us, we kind of walk through the world not really realizing that other people have a different set of viewpoints that they're viewing from. Oh, absolutely. That is that is one of the killers of influence. In, in every way. It's one of the killers in negotiation. It's one of the killers in sales. It's one of the, the, the killers in any type of relationship you may have with, with anyone. It's thinking that other people, thinking that the other person is viewing the world from the same set of beliefs as we are. Because they're probably not. 
you know that's uh, that's actually principle number two is you know understand the clash of belief systems because what is a belief? Well, a belief is a subjective truth. That's important. A belief is a subjective truth. It's the truth as you or as I understand the truth to be, which doesn't mean it's the truth. It means it's our truth. <laughs> and now sometimes our truth and the truth are the same, but many times it's not. Far more often than we think, the truth and our truth are not the same thing. Uh, because we see the world, uh, you know, you've heard it said before, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. Well, that's absolutely true. We see it actually through our own belief system. Our belief system is... Um, a combination of upbringing, environment, schooling, news media, television shows, movies, popular culture, cultural mores, everything we touch, taste, see, hear, smell. Uh, but it's pretty much etched in stone by the time we're a little more than toddlers. So most of us, we grow up uh, with a, a certain, having a certain view of the world, a set of beliefs that were handed to us, basically, right? We didn't consciously take these in. We were babies. We were too young. Um, and so, and we grow up living our lives through what I call an unconscious operating system, thinking that we're making proactive choices, when really we're simply making choices from within a premise or a matrix, if you will, if you remember the, you know, the movie. Uh, and so, so yeah, and then what happens also is on top of that is not only are we seeing the world unconsciously through a certain set of belief, pre-programmed beliefs, but we, so is everyone else, <laughs> everyone we deal with. Now, let's add on top of that, that as human beings, and you brought this up beautifully earlier, we tend to think that the other person sees the world the same basically as we do, which is very intuitive. It makes sense. How could it be anything else? It's all we know. But we also know that's not really true. This is why you often hear people say things like, oh, everybody likes that. Or, oh, no one would want that. Or, you know, if you've ever heard someone say, or if you've said, I know I've said this all too often, oh, I would never treat anyone that way, right? Well, no, we wouldn't because it's not congruent with our beliefs. But for other people, it's totally congruent with their beliefs. <laughs> so the, the key, Marianne, is not to, that necessarily that we understand their belief system. They probably don't understand their belief system. The key is that we understand the clash of belief systems. We understand that their way of seeing the world is probably a lot different from, or at least significantly different, from the way we see the world. And when we do that, we are then in a position to work within a, a uh, context where we can go deeper into understanding their thought processes by asking questions, by listening and so forth, and being able to, uh, uh, you know, to help come to a win-win conclusion. And really to see it from another person's point of view, because, I mean, exactly. we really don't know what those belief systems are. Right. You know? <laughs> There's so many of them out there. You know, it's all based on how they were raised and, and some things that they've developed over time, mm -hmm. which, you know, has me kind of wondering, you know, because you talk about this in your book, about how adversaries, you know, there are partners in our growth and our success. What do you mean by that? Well, because if we approach it the right way, they're helping us to grow, right? Our adversaries are actually helping us to, to grow. If everybody just thought as we thought and believed as we believed, uh, you know, things would be as they are, be, you know, uh, wonderful to a certain point, I guess, but we we certainly wouldn't be able to to grow uh, when we have someone who is difficult to deal with. We have got to know how to effectively deal with that person, and once we do that, we've just stepped up our level of knowledge, of wisdom, of consciousness in in every way. Uh, not that that doesn't mean it's fun. <laughs> right. I mean, obviously, if somebody's difficult to deal with, or you know, that customer service person's not not doing what they should do, or that person in our company in that other silo who's not providing us with the information we need, or that customer who's hard to get in to see, or you know, what have you. Hey, it's not fun. It's not supposed to be fun, I don't think. But when we can see it as a an opportunity for growth, we're certainly able to frame it in a way that serves us a lot better. Also, you know, taking this to an even deeper level, I, I use the example in there of um, of uh, uh, Sadaharu O, oh, who's the uh, the, for, the Japanese professional baseball league uh, player, uh, Hall of Famer, who is the um, 
the all-time home run champion, 865 career home runs. And what he said is that he did not see the opposing pitcher as his adversary, but rather as his partner in hitting home runs. Wow. That's totally going from the competitive to the creative plane. You're seeing that. So, so can you do the same thing? Can you see this person who is a, a, you know, kind of difficult to deal with? Can you actually see them as your partner in growth? And you know, that's a that's a big thing. That is a big thing. Yeah, you because know, it it takes a you really have to kind of step back from how you may be feeling, which is something I want to get into a little bit. Mm-hmm. Here. You know, and you're yeah feeling about all that. Yeah. And, you know, we, in the case of Sadaha Ruo, you know, when I've told that story, people have said, yeah, but I'm sure the other pitcher didn't see himself as a partner in Sadaha Ruo hitting home runs. And my answer would be, absolutely, you're right. <laughs> the pitcher didn't. But just like the person who you're finding difficult to deal with, they probably don't see themselves as a partner in your growth. They're not thinking that deeply, but you are. And that's what counts. As long as you're thinking of that person as a partner in your growth, you can approach that situation from a totally different different viewpoint. And they may not even be in the place where they can even, you know, think about, you know, how to participate in a discussion. Oh, sure. You're, you're now, exactly right. Exactly. Their belief systems, it's all about, you know, it could be like, you know, I've, I've uh, got a kid home it's you know that's homesick. I've got business to run. I've got all these things to do. So they're not even focused on those kind of things. Yeah, most people are not conscious of this. And that's one of the things in the book uh, that I tried to bring about, especially in, in terms of belief systems, that, you know, when we talk about an unconscious operating system, well, you know, even when we understand this, it's still difficult to, you know, to, to act consciously much of the time. It's it's a constant work in process. I can't tell you how often I catch myself uh, being unconscious, right? And so then, you know, that next step is to be conscious of being unconscious. Right? And, you know, it's something you keep, it's something you keep work on, working on. Now, you know, the Dalai Lama might, might totally have mastered this. Um, maybe a few others, Michael Singer, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, and, and some of the others, but I haven't. This is something I continually work on, but I'll say this. I'm much better at it than I used to be because it's something I, I focus on constantly. And we don't have to be perfect. We just need to continue to improve. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Bob Berg in regards to his book, Adversaries into Allies, Master the Art of Ultimate Influence. Again, if you'd like to connect with Bob and learn a little bit more about him, you can at berg.com. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. 
You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest Bob Berg, and he's sharing with us his book, Adversaries into Allies, Master the Art of Ultimate Influence. Now, before we went for a break, we were talking about how your parents have really, they excel in this area, and to have that kind of you know, um, education from a young mm-hmm. age. Mm-hmm. When we talk about people that maybe have come from situations that don't provide them, you know, adequate training in regards mm-hmm. to the interpersonal skills, maybe their parents just weren't, didn't have the skill set themselves. Sure. So it, your book really provides a lot of information on where people can start. Yeah, and, and and I appreciate you saying that because what you're saying is right on point. Remember, their belief system would be one in which it's, you know, every relationship is a battle. Um, I, you know, I think the person who brought this up probably better than anyone ever was uh, Dr. Maxwell Maltz in his 1960s classic uh, Psycho-Cybernetics, when really the whole premise of the book was that, the, you know, the Psycho-Cybernetics simply means mind-machine and that we we basically see the world in a certain way again what i would call belief systems and we see these the 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 truths and these again they're subjective truths so if someone you know why why is it that people generation after generation in a family they have uh um you know uh abusive relationships let's say uh, and it's so sad but if someone grows up as the child within an abusive relationship it's not that they on any level think that that's a good thing, that that's, you know, but it's what they see as the truth. They see this as the way life is. And that's why, and as Dr. Maltz would explain, that when they meet someone and they, they, they're in a relationship where it's just a wonderful, loving, kind relationship, they may feel good about that momentarily, but that's not their truth of the way the world works and that's why they will will unconsciously do things to sabotage that and they'll bring themselves just like one of those you know missiles that that course corrects during flight until it hits the the actual target if their target or the way they see the world is that a relationship is a an unhealthy argumentative even abusive relationship they're going to keep sabotaging everything else and course correcting until they get that way well the only way to ever get out of that pattern is to become consciously aware of it and understand what it really is. Uh, and only then are you in a position to take the steps to to work on yourself and readjust your, your beliefs, which, of course, he helps you do so well uh, in his book. Well, and what's very, you know, I, I applaud you because, I mean, you you bring that up in your book and you talk in a great deal about it, which I feel is very important because coming to that realization that we have belief systems that are different than other people and, and some that may need to be questioned, I think is you know it's like an aha moment for a lot of a lot of our readers and our listeners that are just kind of going, gosh, okay, I need to shift the relationships I have now. Maybe I have conflict at home or at work or everywhere, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, in a sense, it's it's where it begins. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and so, you know, in your book, you share this great example of coming into Canada for a speaking event. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I would love for you to share a little bit about that for our listeners, because, I mean, you look at something, I mean, you're, I, I've known you for a little while, Bob, and you're a very likable guy. You know, everyone <laughs> that meets you likes you, you know, and you, you present very well. So it's, it's, um, challenging to read a, a story where someone, you know, um, maybe isn't quite feeling the same way that I'd say 99% of the populace does when they meet you. <laughs> well, thank you. This, this happened actually many years ago, and of course I've spoken in Canada many times, and I love, I adore my my Canadian friends, and and um, and but you know what? When it comes to the border, they're kind of like the U.S. border people. They're you know bureaucrats and people who have their own kind of ways of doing things. And, and I, I tend to find that 99% of them, both on the Canadian and American side, are a pleasure to deal with. And then there's that 1% that sometimes isn't. <laughs> and w- w- what happened is that on that particular night, I arrived very, very uh, late into Toronto, the Toronto airport. And um, I had a, a program the next morning for a financial services uh, convention conference where I was speaking, and so I arrived very late. I, my my ride I knew was waiting outside. I mean, of course, you go through immigration when you go in, so uh, everything was was going smoothly, and I was at the very last stop um, and the last person. And as I approached her, I smiled as always, and she smiled, very lovely smile, and and um, you know, I gave her my. Uh, you know the information I had filled out, and she asked me why I was coming in. I said to speak at a uh, conference, and she goes, "Oh, you know what kind of conference?" And I said, "Oh, well, it's a for a, um, a company of financial advisors." She goes, and she started asking me kind of you know more questions about them, and and she, and, and she was asking kind of more questions than were necessary. You know, again, I've spoken enough to know what what is necessary to comply with you know with what's needed. But you know, it was okay. I'm, my feeling is I'm a guest in another person's country. Uh, I need to comply with with what they're asking me to do. So, um, but then she she said, so would you consider yourself a uh, a speaker? And I said, uh, well, yes, I, I would. And she goes, well, you know, I, I see a problem with this. And then and I said, well, why? And she goes, well, are, are you receiving for this a um, uh, an honorarium or a uh, speaking fee? And uh, the difference would be that an honorarium is something very small and a speaking fee is something big. <laughs> and I knew that had I said honorarium, uh, that that's the answer she wanted. But I, you know, I... I didn't lie for a couple of reasons. First, it's just not good to lie, and you know, unless you're protecting your life or your family's life or, or something, or if there's a real compelling reason for it, a certain time and place for everything. But that wasn't really the time. But also, had I lied and said honorarium, she probably would have detained me to check, uh, and and ha- and had she found out what I was really receiving and that I had lied to her, uh, she could have sent me right back on the next plane back to Florida. So that wouldn't have been good either. So I, I just said, um, well, I'm receiving a fee. And she goes, well, you know, there's a big problem with that because – and, and she really went into a, a long thing. Now, the entire time, I knew that was not the issue because, again, I've spoken enough in Canada to know – to understand what's what's needed and so forth. There was something else really going on. And so at this point, what I needed to do was really – be sure that I followed my own teaching in terms of how to handle the situation. And the first part is to, which is step number one, and that is to master my own emotions, control my own emotions, not let myself, not let myself become upset based on what what she was doing. Because when we do that, that's you know sort of what the person wants. And so had I started to yell and scream and get demanding and I can't believe you're doing you know blah 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 well that would have that would have not now been her self fulfilling prophecy probably right of of what she was expecting and I so that would not so I needed to control myself and not panic and just you know kind of go with it and and wait things out a little bit the the next part is understand the clash of belief systems she's obviously coming from a different belief than I am as far as what is appropriate now I didn't know what it was yet but I was going to have to, to, to listen and discover that. Um, the next part would also be, you know, maybe understanding that, that ego has something to do with it. Because, again, I knew that, that the problem wasn't what she was saying it, it was. So there was something else going on. Um, 
then, you know, number four is to set the frame. A frame is the foundation from which everything else evolves. Now, she had set a frame of conflict, obviously. So what you need to do when someone else has already set the frame is you need to reset the frame. So had I bought into her frame and made this an argument between the two of us, there's no way I could possibly win. It just wasn't going to happen. She had the positional authority in this case. Um, so I needed to reset the frame, and I did that by continuing to be exceedingly polite and helpful and solicitous and everything I needed to be. And number five is to communicate with tact and empathy. You know, my dad, who I referred to earlier, my dad has always defined tact as the language of strength. And this is, you know, in a sense, it's being able to communicate through your words or through what you say, through how you say it, communicate an idea that someone may not agree with, but communicate this in such a way that they are let, they're they're not defensive toward you or resistant to your ideas, but rather they're open to you and accepting of your ideas. Empathy, which is really kind of more on a more of a heart to heart connection, it's the it's the putting yourself in the position of, of attempting to understand that person's feeling. So you may not understand exactly how they feel or what they feel, but you understand they're feeling something that's distressful to them, and you're there to help them you know, work within that toward a, a, a good solution. So I needed to use all of those. And so as I'm continuing the conversation with her, and then she, you know, she brought another um, person into it, and, and another one of her associates. And then finally in the conversation, she said what I understood was the key. She said, do you happen to know, and she named a uh, speaker, an American speaker, who is a very, very big name, who um, doesn't look like me, but had has some similar features, but, you know, not enough to confuse, but a, a, a popular American speaker. And I said, I, I know of him, sure. And she said, well, he was here a few months ago, and he was the rudest, nastiest person that you have ever, blah, 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 blah. blah. And she went, well, I realized that was it. This was the entire issue. This was all based on emotion. It was based on, you know, uh, her ego had been upset by this person. I guess he was really nasty to her. Uh, and, of course, I don't blame her for being upset. Um, this was the frame. This was everything. So at that point, I understood what it really was, that it was about him. It, it was the problem that she had with him, which was now my problem. And it was my problem. Whether it should be or not isn't the point. We need to deal in truths, not in what we wish it would be. So what I said, and of course I couldn't agree with her about the other person because that would be participating in gossip. I had no right to do that. But what I did say, I, I think I made a joke about myself or something, and then I said something. Well, you know, all I can, I, I said something. I'm sorry you had to experience that. Um, but I, I just, you know, I do appreciate you helping me through this, and just, you know. Um, um, and, you know, please know that I'm a guest, I know, I realize I'm a guest in your country and, and I'm happy to do whatever it is I need to, to comply with your rules. And boom, right there, it was a total turnaround. And she just said, well, um, Mr. Berg, you're so much nicer than that person. And I really shouldn't have blah, 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 you know, whatever. And then that was it. And that, that was it. Now here's the, the interesting thing. I totally believe that she is a very nice person. I mean, she seemed like a lovely person when I first, you know, when when our eyes met and, and she just did. I, but sometimes, because we're human beings, when we have a situation with one person that really upsets us on a very deep emotional level that she obviously carried with her for a while, it can kind of turn us into being someone that we probably aren't. Now, that's not an excuse for the way she acted. There, you know, she shouldn't have done what what she did. But it explains it, and we can understand it, and we can grow from it, and we can, you know, understand that that's part of working effectively as a, as a, as an influencer. Well, I think it provides great insight to how other people feel. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she walked away from that experience with you, feeling like you know she had been kind of just appreciated and yeah. kind of renewed in some way, you know, regardless if. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times these things happen and we never find out about them. Exactly, exactly. And just kind of like how she felt. Well, it's interesting because you did touch on the emotion aspect of it. And I know we're kind of hopping around a little bit here because, I mean, you've got 
That's okay. Several principles in the book, but we're not going to cover them all because, you know, people do want to go pick up their own copy of Adversaries into Allies. But, you know, the emotional aspect is so huge. When we talk about being in control of your emotions, I mean, I think that's a place where sometimes people, they get their button pushed and they're like, you know, it's game on now instead of really being involved in the conversation in a deeper way. Oh, it, it, you know, it it begins there. I mean, um, you know, it begins with consciousness of it, but but it it starts out with the emotions. Uh, The the sages of old asked, "Who who is mighty? And answered, that person who can control their own emotions and make of an enemy or of a potential enemy a friend. And you think of it, it's only when we're in control of ourselves, when we're in control of our emotions, that we're even in a position to be able to take a potentially negative situation or person, uh, as we just discussed, and turn it into a win for everyone involved. And yet, how often, as you said, you know, do we as human beings allow someone based on what they said or they did to push our emotional hot buttons and we cause ourselves to become upset or frustrated or victimy or or angry right and we say or do something that we know is so counterproductive to accomplishing what we want is that you know if we ask ourselves the question well if we know better why do we do that and the answer i believe is because we're human beings and as human beings we are emotional creatures. Uh, we'd like to think we're logical, and, and of course, to a certain extent we are, but we're basically, we're emotion-driven, and we make major decisions based on emotion. We back up those decisions with logic. We rationalize, right, which is really nothing more than that we tell ourselves rational lies, and we do this to, you know, justify saying or doing that which we know we shouldn't have done or or taking an action that we know is really not in our, our best, most logical interest. And so uh, we need to really be aware of our emotions and be in charge of them. And what we're not saying is that you should uh, deny your emotions or forego your emotions. First, it, it would not make sense to do so. It's, it's contrary to human nature. We, we couldn't do it. But also, it's not necessary. Emotions are a wonderful part of, of life. They make life worthwhile. They bring us joy. They bring us pleasure. Um, but So no, by, by all means, uh, we want you to have your emotions. We, it's just that you need to be in control of your emotions as opposed to your emotions being in control of you. Or as one of my great friends, the leadership authority, Don Scumachi, so beautifully puts it, by all means, take your emotions along for the ride. But make sure you are driving the car. You need to be at the wheel, right? Your emotions need to be safely seatbelt fastened in the passenger seat. Take them with you. Our emotions have wisdom to share, but it's our our logical self that needs to be the driver if we want to create the environment where the decisions we're making are, are generally the best ones. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, otherwise it's a roller coaster ride. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of going along going along on the big roller coaster right there. Well, in you know, it's interesting because when people think about adversaries into allies, when they think about your book, you know, it, it can be used more than just interpersonal connections with people at home and people become across in, in contact. I mean, it really is a great book to use in business. You know, with uh, thank you, with clients, with you know, other people we work with, because you know, sometimes it's you know, life is difficult, and and uh, navigating all that can be a little challenging. Yeah, you know, I think like any principle, it it works across the board uh, if it's a true principle, you know. And so I, you know, we we like to think that this will work in terms of of success in the various areas that we think of success being, whether it's financial, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, social, relational, that these um, these principles can can hopefully you know apply uh, across the board. Well, they do without a doubt. And again, I mean, there's so much. It's just a book that's filled with a vast amount of knowledge and wisdom. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. I appreciate that. that. Yeah, I mean... I, I once I picked it up, I was just going through it, and I've been rereading it because there are, are points that are like, gosh, you know, I really need to get this. 
And it's interesting, in your book you talk about, and I think this is a good thing to, to discuss, you talk about, you know, just being able to say no with grace and having it be effective. And I think a lot of times people have real difficulty in being able to do that without sure. being aggressive. Right. Well, you know, again, it's a human thing because we we really, I don't think we want to disappoint people, you know, especially if we're asked to do something that's not a, uh, uh, an, a not an out of line, you know, not an inappropriate request, but something a lot of times we're asked to do something, it, you know, it means somebody thought highly enough of us to ask. Um, and, you know, we, we, we want to please others. You know, again, that's just a human thing. Now, that's fine as long as it doesn't take away from your own happiness or peace of mind and, and so forth. You know, we're, I'm not a big believer in being a, a martyr or being self-sacrificial uh, unless there's a real good reason for it, you know, such as someone's life or, or you know, or uh, or something that, you know, is very but, – but by and large, you know, my feeling is if you don't want to do something, then – you should be able to say no, but say no in such a way that it really genuinely makes the other person feel good about themselves, feel honored and respected while it protects your boundaries. And I've heard various you know, ways of, 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 um, of saying no. And uh, again, while I, I never want to diss any other type of teaching and everything will work at times, uh, I think the, the ways that it's often taught, I think, are, are counterproductive to doing it in what I would consider the right way, which again, doesn't mean I'm right, but, but the way that I would, you know, that I would believe. Uh, because I've, I've heard people say, well, no is a complete sentence. And that seems to be the, net, you know, the new kind of thing. People know is a complete sentence. And I've, I've seen people hear that and nod their heads in empowerment. Oh, yeah, next time someone asks me to do something, I'm just going to say no. You know, that's, and really, that sounds good in theory. And I understand the, the idea. You know, the idea is you shouldn't feel compelled to do something you don't want to do. I, I agree with that. Absolutely. But there's a big difference in that and in the way that you relay it to someone. <laughs> so, you know, if, if we take the generic uh, example of someone asking you to serve on a committee and you just don't want to do it for whatever reason, you don't want to, you don't want to. Well, if they ask, are you really just going to say no? I mean, is that really a complete sentence? I don't believe it is. First, it's it's rude, it's impolite. Secondly, you're turning a maybe a, an a, a ally into an adversary doing it that way, and that person's probably never going to come back and ask you to do anything again. And you may want to keep the door open to to doing future things with that person. It's just this particular thing you don't want to do. So I, I don't think that no is a complete sentence. I don't think no is a complete sentence when it comes to saying no correctly, appropriately. Uh, another way people are sometimes taught is to kind of fib a little bit. Well, you know, I would, but I don't have the time. Uh, this is troublesome for a couple of reasons. <laughs> One is because, you know, you, it never feels good to fib. And, and you know that even if you – and it isn't that you don't have the time. As human beings, we don't have the time. We make the time to do that which we want to do. What it really means, what you're really saying is, I don't value doing this as much as I value not doing this. Again, for whatever reason it might be, and that's and that's true. Um, and so, so on 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 one hand, you kind of don't feel good about yourself that you're not really being honest. Um, but also, you've set yourself up when you say, I don't, I would, but I don't have the time. Uh, you're setting yourself for that person who's heard this quite a bit and ha probably has a compelling reason why time will not be an issue for you. And when they do, now you're in a bad position. Now you've got to either uh, say, well, okay, uh, let me come clean. It's not that I don't have the time. I just don't want to do it, which, again, is going to make them a little bit mad, and you're not going to feel good. Or in order to save face, you've got to, oh, okay, in that case, I'll do it. You've got to take the take the gig that you don't want to take. And that's not good. And it's the same if you said, well, I don't have the time right now. Well, that person's going to come back and say, oh, that's okay. We're going to be doing this six months from now. Is it, can you commit to doing it that? So again, by, by doing this, you're not, you're, you're, you're hurting yourself. So let me suggest an, a very easy way to do this. <laughs> that, that if you'll just practice it a couple of times, it will really set you free. 
and you can be both honest and kind and genuine and tactful and honor the other person. So again, let's say the person asks you to serve on this committee. You certainly, you, you simply say, thank you so much for asking. While it's not something I'd like to do, please know how honored I am to be asked. And that's it. That's it. And yeah, you can say it a little bit, the word's a little bit different depending upon your own style. It might be, oh, thank you so much. While it's not something I choose to pursue or you know, not something I choose to do, uh, please know how, how grateful I am or how honored and grateful I am to be asked. However you want to say it, it's fine. But, but that basic, that basic uh, idea, what you're doing is again, you're thanking them, you're honoring them, you're letting them know how honored you are just to be thought of, to be asked. But you're also letting them know it's not something that you're choosing to do, but you have not given them something to hold on to that they can overcome and answer and, and do that. And now, and so again, my, my way of doing it would be, thank you so much for asking. While it's not something I'd like to do, Please know how honored I am to be asked. And 99% of the time, that's it. They'll thank you for the way you did it. You can do this through email, on the phone, in person, doesn't matter. Now, if they're the type who, you know, they generally don't take a first no as an answer, and there'll be those types, or you may have trained people that you can be, you know, kind of bullied or coerced, and you need to kind of retrain. Um, if they say, oh, come on, but we really need it, you know, blah, 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 whatever, you simply listen. You don't interrupt them. You just listen uh, with a very calm, serene look, no defensiveness. And once they finish, you just simply say, oh, I, I'd rather not, but I so appreciate the offer. Thank you. Boom. You and know, how how graceful is that? I mean, how there's not many people that can, you know, really get angry at, a, at that kind of a no. Yeah. Right, exactly. And I can't tell you how often I've had people thank me, and I've had others who've reported back to me, you know, how people have actually thanked them and told them, wow, they're going to say the same thing to people, you know, after after being told no like that. So, yeah, it absolutely works, and it does so in a way that's very uh, kind. Mm-hmm. And it kind of works for them. Well, and, you know, gosh, I mean, I obviously I have more questions than we have time for, but that's usually how it goes when we talk, especially about your books. Well, you know, and yeah, and, and goodness, Bob, what are some of the final thoughts you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Well, I think in a sense, it's you know, first, it's just being willing to apply the information, not not worrying about being perfect with it, but understanding that once you start to you know, again, not even master it, but just become proficient at it. Uh, suddenly you have a lot more self-confidence. You become even better liked, more respect, highly trusted, far more influential in your world. And much of it just has to do by remembering to, to move from an I focus or me focus to what we call an other focus, where you understand that you know the, the best influencers know that it's not about them. It's about that person they want to influence, whose lives they want to touch. Yeah, I mean, it, it really makes such a difference. I mean, your book, Adversaries into Allies, is a great way for people to springboard into creating right relationships with those around them. And, um, oh, and before we go, Bob, where can people connect with you and be part of your community? I know you do all these great, you know, you do Facebook Lives, you do all yeah. these great things that people can, you know, participate in. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just probably the uh, best place is thegogiver.com without the hyphen, thegogiver.com. And if people scroll down the page, they'll see all sorts of goodies they can uh, they can plug into if they'd like. And, and uh, connect with you there. Well, you know, Bob, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. My pleasure. I always love talking with you. It's always a joy for me. We don't we don't do it enough, and it's just uh, you know you, you're so great at what you do, and you make such a difference in so many people's lives, including my own. So keep up the great work, my friend. Oh well, thank you, Bob. It is always such a pleasure and a treat to spend time with you, and of course to talk about your life changing books. I'm so glad that we got to talk about adversaries into allies. It's one of the books I've been really wanting to talk with you about and what a life-changing book that is.
Again, if you'd like to connect with Bob, you can at his website, berg.com, and that's spelled B-U-R-G.com. He'll have information there in regards to all the other books he's written. Highly suggest picking them all up. They've been a game changer for me, and I'm sure that you'll find value in them as well. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.